Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome, everyone, to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. It is June 6, 2018, and I am your host, Chris Martinson. Our view at Peak Prosperity is that the attempt by the world's central banks to replace the business cycle with a credit cycle is both foolish and ultimately self-destructive, at least for the majority. Of course, one of the key features that keeps insiders promoting and supporting the credit cycle approach is that the well-connected become fantastically wealthy as part of that process. However, the credit cycle also promoted boom-bust cycles that have been getting larger and larger the longer they persist. We're now very far along in the third credit boom cycle since just the year 2000, and the bust is going to be absolutely spectacular. That's our view. Which means, for us, that investing safely or even preserving the purchasing power of your money is going to be a very tricky proposition. How to invest? Where to keep your money? Well, keep listening because today we're going to be discussing the always amazing report titled In Gold We Trust with one of its lead authors, Ronald Sturfeli. This report is published annually by the Liechtenstein-based investment and asset management company, Incrementum AG, and this year's edition is a real keeper, just like they all are, but this one is amazing. Hey, I first met Ronnie in person last year at the Munich Metals Conference, and I really liked him right away. Smart, well-read, and he's desiring to help people both grow and protect their wealth. Roni is a partner of Incrementum AG and is responsible for research and portfolio management. Also, he's the author of several books, one on Austrian economics and a second on the zero interest rate trap. He's got a lot of experience in investing and trading. Hey, and he's a very well-rounded individual. Hey, welcome, Roni. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> That's a very nice introduction. Thank you very much. Oh, oh you're welcome. You're welcome. Listen, I, I, just, I just loved... Uh, your report in Gold We Trust this year, uh, you know, because I, I love I love data, I love I love things being sourced. It's just it's packed with information. It's very well written. First, tell us, hey, talk to us about how long you've been writing this report. It's annual, and what's maybe changed along the way. Well, uh, I'm writing it for 12 years now, and actually we reached an all-time high, not not in the price of gold, but in the length of the report. So this year <laughs> we wrote 230 pages. It's quite a break, so um, you probably have to um, spend like a weekend to, to study the report. As you've said, there's quite a lot of different sources, many angles uh, where we're analyzing gold, many charts. We're very, very much data-driven. Um, and actually I started um, writing about gold um, when I was a, a young young analyst um, sitting in an Austrian bank as the group in, in, in Vienna and I had for my private account I had a, a mining stock that did really well and I had no clue about gold and the mining sector itself. I, I was really lucky. So I went to my boss and said, you know, can I perhaps um, um, spend some time about uh, on, 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 on researching gold? And he said, yeah, go ahead. So this was the first report in 2007 called In Gold We Trust and yeah, uh, from from then on, I'm, I, I have to say that the first edition was very basic, just analyzing supply demand. Um, but then I found out about the so-called Austrian school of economics. And it, it might sound a bit odd because I am from Austria, um, but nobody really knows the Austrians. Uh, Ludwig von Mises, of course, Friedrich August von Hayek, Karl Menger, and so on. Uh, it's not taught at all uh, on university or in schools. So uh, for, for me, it's been um, kind of this red pill moment when I read the first uh, quote by Ludwig von Mises and then I googled it and said yeah, the Austrian School of Economics so I ordered all the books that I could find on Amazon and yeah then started into digging, digging into this topic and it, it, it completely changed my worldview. Of course 2008 happened and I saw the crisis coming from a different angle 
from this Austrian perspective, analyzing uh, credit cycles. And then at some point, somebody told me, you know, you know, if, 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 if you're an Austrian and kind of a gold bug sitting in a bank, you're like the vegetarian in the big butchery. And I said, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of right. So, so I, I, I set up my own company together with some partners from Austria and from Switzerland. And we set up the company in Liechtenstein. Um, it's no coincidence because the Liechtenstein family, they actually run the country like it was a business. They know the Austrian School of Economics. It's, it's a fabulous small country in the center of Europe. And yeah, so it's, it's my passion and, and, and one of my biggest interests, of course, um, studying uh, monetary history, financial history, combining that um, with um, uh, analysis on the current market situation. And I really enjoy writing. And I kind of hope that um, that 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 I can also kind of help people understanding the monetary system. And uh, you know, last year we had more than 1.7 million downloads for the report. It was quoted in uh, more than 60 pages, uh, 60 countries all over the globe. So I, I really hope that I can make some sort of sort of impact. Yeah, and and that that yeah, that's really why I enjoy uh, this work so much. Well, it, it's really, it's a very educational piece, and, and it is, you know, it's just packed with, with charts and sources, as I've mentioned, and, and you've summarized this into just three key pivotal takeaways. Uh, let's start with that first there. Um, you say there that the tide is turning in monetary policy. Uh, discuss that with us, please. Yeah, um, we, you know, taking a step back, um, since the year 2008, the biggest central banks all over the globe, they created 14 trillion, which is 14,000 billion um, uh, out of thin air, basically. And of course, um, that had an impact on the markets. This created this everything bubble. And I think that people, they vastly underestimated the consequences of quantitative easing. And my conclusion in the report is that they are also vastly underestimating the consequences of quantitative tightening because the Federal Reserve, um, they're, they're on a clear path. They've communicated that they will just reduce central bank liquidity this year by 420 billion, next year 600 billion. They, um, they, 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 uh, um, Increase it every quarter. So starting in October, it will be 50 billion um, per month, and that's 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 quite a lot of money actually. And it's not only the Federal Reserve that will become more hawkish. It's also to some extent the uh, the, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of Canada, Bank of England, and so on. So uh, we're seeing that this 10-year-long liquidity party is coming to an end and this will have consequences. We have seen a credit induced boom and sooner or later this monetary U-turn will lead to a recession. And Chris, nobody is actually um, seeing a recession on the horizon at the moment. We always come up with this chart. Um, the I think 78 um, economists, um, most highly regarded economists, probably with an IQ of 270 and uh, eight PhDs from Ivy League schools. Um, they are always questioned by Bloomberg um, on their uh, forecasts. And what do you think out of those? 78 analysts how many do see a recession in the next three years <laughs> zero zero exactly <laughs> exactly how many saw a recession coming in 2007 uh zero zero exactly <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what, what i want to say is I, i'm not sure I, I i don't want to say that 2019 or 2020 there will 100 percent be a recession but the market is completely um, underestimating the recessionary fears that we are already seeing. And, and if, if, if the positioning 
um, uh, in, in, in the market is, is, is that extreme. That's also going to mean that if there's only a small shift and if recessionary fears come up, this is going to have huge consequences for asset allocations. So um, if a recession is coming and I think there's some, some clear signs, we're seeing rising rates, we're seeing QT, we're seeing an M&A boom, we're seeing record high consumer confidence and job market is booming, we're seeing inflation, price inflation is rising, but we're already seeing rising default rates rates, rising write-offs on credit card debt and so on. So perhaps I'm, I'm just a, a bit too, too bearish, but from my point of view, there's clear signs that a recession is on the horizon. And that's gonna probably going to be one of the biggest drivers for the price of gold going forward. Now, I want to get to how that drives the price of gold, but I, I would like to, um, lots to chew on there, a fantastic summary. And I would like to interject that there are a couple of, of economist types I've run into who are looking at this. Uh, one, I'm sure you're familiar with, Steen Jakobsen out of Saxo. He, he sees a recession coming because of the credit impulse that uh, you know now we have this whole market which is just credit based and you either have more credit or less credit less credit even if it's you said we had 10 percent credit growth this year just having 10 percent next year is actually recessionary given how the system works it's it's a, a piece that um uh is uh, steve keen has done a great job sort of yeah. modeling that and helping me understand that and as well interestingly got to interview um the chief economist for fannie mae just a few months ago, he also sees a recession in 2019, but for different reasons. Um, not not for sure, but, you know, like 60% chance kind of a thing. So there are a few out there who sort of see this. Of course, never. I, you won't see those people on, on TV too much because um, <laughs> that's not how that works. So <laughs> so let's talk about how, though, you know, because I love that you have this Austrian background. We can talk about this in terms of monetary and credit cycle growth. And, of course, the key economists of today almost never talk about the role of debt in an economy. It's just a it's a wonderful thing. You should have more of it, right? <laughs> when 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 you say that the price of gold may do well in a recession, let's talk about what you actually mean by recession, given that what you're talking about, I think, not to put words in your mouth, correct me if I'm wrong, is a recession that's coming as a result of, 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 a, of the end of expansion of the credit cycle rather than as a business cycle recession. So, so talk about that and why that sort of recession is, a, is kind of a beast, potentially. Uh, yeah, uh, of, of, uh, I, I, I totally agree with with, with with your view, and 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 I think that, I mean, first of all, uh, I, I want to say that the recession, per definition, is not something negative. You actually need recessions because it makes the system, uh, it makes market participants, it makes um, uh, companies more robust. Um, so, so I think. Um, artificially avoiding a recession and just putting liquidity into the market just to avoid this bad R word. Um, that actually makes the system uh, much more much more fragile and 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 and, and um, insecure. So um, the Austrian view is recessions are just something normal. They are something positive because it makes the whole system um, healthier. Um, now, of course, we are seeing massively falling marginal utility of new debt. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, as, as you referred to, um, we always need a, a higher growth rate. And if, if we are talking about credit, for example, um, we are seeing that uh, at the moment, um, uh, uh, monetary aggregates, like the broad monetary aggregates uh, in the US, they're, uh, they're growing at a very, very low rate at the moment. So, so I think it's, 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 it's like uh, two or three percent at the moment. And um, uh, Lacey Hunt, Dr. Lacey Hunt has done a tremendous job uh, analyzing uh, that kind of uh, uh, credit growth slowdowns. And she also came to the conclusion that uh, a recession might hit the market very soon. Um, so, 
it's it's that in combination with the flattening yield curve that we are seeing that the yield curve will probably invert in a couple of months and of course um, uh, all the experts are coming out and saying, you know, this time it's really different. This hmm. time an inversion of the yield curve will have uh, no no consequence and it's not a, um, a, a sign that a recession is on the horizon. But, you know, at the end it's not different this time. So um, – <laughs> I, yeah. I, I think, and, and you know, uh, what, what we also did in the report is we just had a look at the numbers um, published by the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office. And uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, I would say it's, if, 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 if I'm polite, I would say it's, it's um, a bit naive to say that in the next 10 years, there will actually be no recession in the US. But still under this uh, assumption, very positive, very rosy economic outlook for the US, um, the CBO um, is seeing um, uh, 1 billion uh, annual deficit for the next 10 years. So um, the, the, the cu cumulative deficit for 2018 to 2028 will be 13 billion altogether. Ex again, taking into account that there's uh, no recession hitting the markets. And I, I think you don't have to have a, a PhD in economics or mathematics to show that, you know, there's not too much room for rising rates, for especially for rising real rates. And um, of course, this problem that we're seeing is, 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 is not only US centric, we're seeing the same over here in Europe. Let's not forget uh, the Italians, but also the Spanish and the French. They basically voted against this German-led austerity policy. So there were massive changes in those three very, very important countries in the Eurozone. So um, I think that that's, that's going to have massive consequences for their policies. And, you know, all those little, little, little signs just lead me to the conclusion that you should have at least... Um, you should have at least some um, exposure to gold. Yeah, it it shouldn't be two percent. It should probably be be significantly more. But I think just from a risk reward perspective, it's just a very very attractive investment at the moment. Absolutely, and and one I think is a linguistic correction. You said uh, thirteen billion. It's thirteen trillion. Trillion. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Uh, so with that, um, I want to talk about the impact on the price of gold because it, you know in my research and. You know, please correct me if I've got this wrong, but I don't see a super tight correlation with inflation and the price of gold. But I do see a pretty good correlation with um, the federal government in the United States running large deficits. Um, that seems to be, uh, you know, it's just it's emitting tons and tons of money into the system. And um, that often has a, a pretty good correlation as well as um, negative real rates of return. And if, as inflation ticks up, I think that the way I'm looking at this, inflation is going to outpace the increase in interest rates. Um, and I'm talking about the real rate of inflation. For instance, my yeah. Bureau of Labor Statistics tells me that inflation on an annual rate for medical care in my country is running 2.2%. And my my state is uh, being petitioned by my insurance company to have a 26% increase in my insurance um, uh, premiums for for uh, my you know healthcare insurance. So uh, not not you know something that confuses Europeans a lot because uh, you know just a crazy system <laughs> over here. But that's our system, right? <laughs> so I see inflation running a lot hotter than than even the uh, interest rates going up. Those are both gold positive. But if we do have this recession, what are some reasons that you would think gold might do well rather than sort of get clubbed in a deflationary uh, outcome? Why would gold do well in this next recession? Well, well, well. Actually, um, 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 we we crunched the numbers and 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 we analyzed the, the last couple of recessions and 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 the uh, the 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 result is is, is pretty clear. Uh, on average, in the last couple of recessions, gold rose um, by twenty percent. Um, so I think gold kind of discounts that there will be. Um, there will be stimulus, that there will be monetary stimulus by the central banks, that there will be fiscal stimulus by politicians and so on. And of course, um, when the recession heads, uh, hits, um, you know, equity markets uh, tend to go 
go weaker. Um, we might see problems in real estate markets and so on. So everybody will seek for a safe haven. And that, of course, we don't know if it's going to be the same again. Uh, perhaps uh, loads of money will go into, into, into Bitcoin. Uh, I don't know. I think Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, um, they, they haven't experienced full business cycle yet so nobody really knows uh, how they're going to develop in a in a in, in a big crisis or in a crash scenario but i think there's there's going to be quite a quite a quite a bit on gold of course now um as, as you rightly say um recessions tend to be deflationary that's that's completely correct so f f for us i think uh, just just to 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 step back um, inflation in in our in in in, in, in investments uh, is a is a very very important topic. So we we are running one fund that is um, some sort of a, a, a inf inflation um, diversifier, and we calculate we are calculating our incrementum inflation signal. So we actually don't care about all those CPI PCE government statistics. Yeah, it's it, mm -hmm. it's nonsense because it's mm -hmm. um, it's very subjective. Yeah, it's always lagging. Um, so we, we, we don't care about that. And of course, we know that since the 1980s, um, as uh, I think John Williams of Shadowstat said, um, I, I think they have changed the way that they're calculating um, those baskets. They've changed it like uh, a couple of dozen, dozen times. So um, we all agree that that the sense of, of price inflation is that it's much higher than those 1.5 or 2 percent that that um, uh, central bankers uh, always hope for. Uh, but I think what's what's really important is to 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 step step back and and explain also from a linguistic point of view, um, what the Austrian School of Economics sees uh, in inflation. So for, for, for us, inflation from the uh, 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 Latin inflare, to inflate something, yeah, um, means the expansion of the money supply, while price inflation, which is continuously rising prices, it's only a consequence. So um, based on Murray Rothbard, he said that the first step is always monetary inflation. Then we're seeing asset price inflation. And only the third stage is rising price inflation. Now, all over the globe, we're seeing at the moment that inflationary pressure is rising, actually. We're seeing that oil prices are rising big time. However, nobody is... Is is, 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 is is bullish on, on oil at the moment for, for some reason. We've been one of the few um, um, bulls on oil uh, in the last couple of years. We are seeing that um, 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 that um, uh, wage wage inflation is becoming a problem. We are seeing um, that's that's a great study by by Eric Cinnamon. Um, um, he he analyzed the the conference calls with uh, with dozens of companies from the from the US, and he actually um, published a great piece. It's called "Inflation Subsiding or Accelerating." He's listing dozens of examples of rising costs and 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 and, and pricing that he gathered from those quarterly earning review uh, 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 calls. So uh, it seems that many CEOs. In the U.S., are very, very concerned about wage inflation, about uh, massively rising input prices. And the interesting thing is, you know, central bankers are, are, are quite open. They always say they want more inflation. Of course, they say, okay, we we can accept some overshooting for the short short term, like three or four percent. But then we will put the genie into the bottle again. It just doesn't work that way. Hmm. So I think that um, you know monetary policy or or, or, or managing an economy. If you study if history, it doesn't just doesn't work that way. It's just too complex. You cannot put all market participants, human beings, into a big um, financial model. It just doesn't work that way. And that makes me think that inflation might overshoot big time and 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 what we 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 found out um and 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 i think we wrote more than 1500 pages of research about gold 
we found out that actually the most important driver for gold is the direction of real rates. So given the fact that debt is all over the globe a big problem, I think I just cannot imagine that real rates will rise significantly because that would obviously be uh, very negative for gold. So real rates being the, the, a big driver for gold, I agree. I, I've, I've seen that as well. Let me let me get to something, though. You, we've talked about the everything bubble. I've written about the everything bubble. Well, it's not really everything. It is stocks, bonds, and real estate. And, of course, there's massive bubbles there, a lot of pain coming. You know, to speaking about Europe, just very quickly, the junk debt being uh, trading at one point at less than 2%, just, you know, not six months ago. Uh, just massive losses coming to whoever's on the other side of that trade, obviously. But... Uh, uh, I noticed, uh, Roni, maybe you can help me understand this. QE3 comes along. It's the largest monetary printing experiment ever in the world's history. It's $85 billion a month. It comes out in 2011. And within just a, a few weeks after that, gold and other commodities began a long, sustained fall, which was very counterintuitive, to say the least. First, do you have any explanation for that? And second, would you agree with the idea that the everything bubble needs an asterisk because commodities have not been part of that bubble yet? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, uh, commodities and especially gold are probably the anti-bubble. Um, when it comes to QE3, that's that's a very good point that you're making, and 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 um, it's 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 hard to to find like uh, one reason why gold didn't really react to to QE3. But I think we should not forget that that gold rose from two hundred dollars up to 1900 uh, within a couple of years. So so it has made uh, a huge move. And of course, there was room for some uh, consolidation. Now, back then, nobody would have uh, uh, expected that it will be, would be that, that, that dramatic. Um, 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 but, but still, I think, you know, um, many, many people always blame the the, the bad manipulators and so on. Of course, there's intervention happening in the gold market, yeah. But there's also uh, intervention happening uh, in every market, True. yeah. Like in the oil market, of course. I mean, what what the central banks are doing, yeah, manipulating interest rates. That's definitely the, the biggest manipulation that nobody is 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 really discussing. Uh, but some 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 nerdy uh, Austrian economists. Um, so. So, so, so I think you know if 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 we have a look at the longer term development of gold, um, gold is, is 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 still up. It was up fourteen percent last year in dollar terms. Uh, it is it is up in 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 most of the major currencies this year. It's hitting new all time highs in many emerging market currencies. Just have a look at gold priced in Turkish lira, for example. Yeah. So f f for them. Gold is a perfect currency hedge um, for, 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 for the Turks. So um, I think this kind of divergence that we're seeing that most uh, market participants thinking that gold is completely dead um, and, and the market actually telling us that we might be in the early stages of a new bull market, that, that makes me pretty confident because based on a commitment of traders report, based on sentiment and so on, um, I think gold is actually quite a contrarian uh, uh, investment at the moment. Well, gold prices really haven't been going anywhere for years here. And, and in, in recent months, it feels like it's practically dead, um, just bumping around between, say, 1300, 1360, uh, somewhere in that zone. Uh, first, you know, how do you explain that it's, it's really been um, going nowhere for years? And second, you know, why? And I get this question. People ask, well, why can't it just keep going nowhere for a lot longer? Um, and and I think that that you know whether you believe it's manipulation or that you know the the bullion banks just have a stranglehold on the market, whatever you're thinking, it certainly hasn't been uh, a very exciting uh, in terms of movement uh, asset class recently um, all that much. How do you explain that? And and what what would make you think that that the gold could um, become untethered from whatever forces are keeping it at bay? Uh, well, I agree. Uh, it's it's been super boring the last couple of years. It's 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 uh, it's frustrating. I I I, I, I quoted a, a journalist uh, from Germany. He said, "Gold is dancing cha cha cha, one step forward, one step to the side, and one step back." It's 
Uh, it, it is kind of frustrating because there have been those couple of attempts to um, to rise above this massive resistance at 1360, 1380. Um, we didn't succeed, um, but but. But then I have to quote uh, another great colleague, uh, Adrian Day, who said people are expecting too much from gold. Um, we, sh we should not forget that, that, that stocks are trading at or very close to the all-time highs, that real estate is doing really well, um, that you know um, bond markets are still doing, doing well, that um, cryptocurrencies are kind of stealing the show, that uh, people kind of regained trust in the financial system, in banks and even in politicians. Um, inflation is not a big concern at the moment we're seeing rising rates and so on so so you know let's face it uh, based on those those things um, we should say that that's that's actually not a uh, extremely um, positive environment for gold but still it's doing pretty well and I think if those those headwinds become tailwinds meaning that okay there will be uh, 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 some 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 volatility kicking in in equity markets um, that the bond markets are perhaps uh, kind of cracking that people lose trust in the system again I think that's really gonna be the point in time when gold will pick up momentum when all those uh, wealth managers, private bankers, uh, asset allocators all over the globe that used to say, you know, you should have at least 5 to 10% uh, gold in your portfolio. Now they're saying gold, ridiculous, you shouldn't own it. You should own all those tech stocks in the US. But if that changes, and that's that's not going to happen from, from one day to another, that's a process. But once that changes, gold will up will pick up momentum big time. Now, let's talk um, very quickly about one of the most frustrating things I know about in the gold market, which is trying to actually determine supply and demand uh, stocks and flows. I can't get good data on the stocks. I'm wondering, you know, as you uh, went through, you know, really researching the gold market, um, th this is a question, Roni, where I'm trying to get to, to really understanding about what appears to me to be a pretty substantial movement, if not rush, of gold from the West to the East, from New York, from London through Switzerland, ending up in, in China and India and places like that, and Russia increasingly. Um, first, how much important do you, do you ascribe to the flows of gold from west to east? And second, uh, how, do, how much can you tell us about the stocks of gold? You know, that gold has to come from somewhere. Where is it coming from? Well, uh, that's, that's a very, very, very good point. Um, um, I think that 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 this move from the from the west to the east, um, as 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 uh, some uh, historian once 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 said, gold is always flowing um, to um, to countries that prosper, that that grow, that have got attractive demographics and so on. So it's pretty obvious that it's it's flowing from the west to the east, and it's no coincidence that by far the most important drivers in the gold market um, 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 for, for, for the central banks are those emerging market central banks. Uh, China, of course, they, they, they own much more gold than they, than they uh, officially publish. Uh, we're seeing that the Indians are, are, are buying gold like crazy. We're seeing Russia. Russia has actually um, by far the highest gold coverage of their of their currency, the Russian ruble. Um, it's it's Kazakhstan, it's Turkey, uh, all those uh, countries. They they kind of want to to hedge their their dollar risks. They are building up uh, reserves. Of course, they've got less gold reserves uh, than than the Western countries. Um, but but this is a, a that, that that that's really a a long term trend that we're seeing. Um, when it comes to stock to flow, I think that's one of the, 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 the most important things that differentiates our analysis from, 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 from other, um, uh, other research um, 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 pieces. Um, we actually don't care too much about just the annual or quarterly supply and demand of gold. So from my point of view, it's, it's pretty irrelevant if, if uh, gold production is up 1.5 or down 1.5% next year um, because the stock, of, uh, the stock of gold 
is so enormous compared to the flow. So uh, there's roughly 190,000 tons of gold available um, that has been mined throughout history. Actually, nobody really knows if that number is accurate or if it's going to be even more. Um, but let's say, okay, it's 190,000 tons of gold. So in comparison to that, the annual flow, the annual production is extremely small. Um, with um, um, 3,300 tons at the moment. Mm -hmm. So um, th that's, I think, the big difference um, 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 that gold has compared to commodities that are consumed, like like oil or uh, agricultural commodities and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's 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 a huge difference. And the stock to flow ratio is something that we um, analyzed really at length in the last couple of reports. It's really an important concept to understand um, where actually those those flows come from. Uh, of course, um, of course, it's um, um, from 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 Western Western markets, uh, I know the numbers from from the Swiss refineries, um, and there's lots of gold coming over London uh, and then over Switzerland uh, that is shipped mainly to China. How long can it continue? I don't know. Perhaps at some point there's not going to be enough gold um, um, uh, available in the West anymore. I think that the Big thing, and this is also the concept of the de-dollarization that we um, that we featured in the report. The big thing is that the whole world actually is trying to um, trying to diversify out of the U.S. dollar. So we are coming to a multipolar um, a, a currency system sooner or later. That's a long process, and I think this year we have seen with the introduction of the oil futures in. In, in Shanghai, I think that's that's been really a big topic. Volumes are enormous in Shanghai. Nobody would have expected that. Uh, and that's just another, um, how do you say, another nail in the coffin of the US dollar. Um, and, and of course, all those countries um, that are uh, trying to avoid the US dollar in their trade, um, they're big holders of gold. So I think in, in within the next course of the crisis, I think there might be some revaluation of gold. This is a concept that we are also um, discussing at length in the report. Yes, I hold gold mainly as a monetary asset, and I'm, I'm using it against monetary shenanigans. And, and um, uh, as I think, as you said, uh, it's a surreal monetary landscape out there right now. It just totally is. Ten years ago, Roni, nobody could have convinced me that we'd be where we are today with central banks intervening constantly and printing like crazy with, with very little discussion of what the risks are if they fail, which seems binary to me. They either fail spectacularly or they succeed with not a lot of middle ground. Um, feels like we should be talking about that more, which is, of course, why you produce the report you do and, and I hold the podcast I do, because people need to know about this. And thank you for bringing up your second key takeaway about that turning of the tide in the global monetary architecture, which is really a fancy way of saying, um, uh, if I could be non not very political, a lot of countries are fed up with the United States sort of dictating, um, you know, we, their their economic might and will, you know, imposing sanctions willy nilly or cutting banks or uh, other individuals at the individual level, even out of the financial system. So people, countries are looking for another way. And that kind of brings us to your third key takeaway about the turning of the tide and technological progress. And you notice uh, you note that your view cryptocurrencies, they're here to stay. And, but you summarize this uh, as well in your, and tie it to gold by saying that, that you think that cryptocurrencies and gold are friends, not enemies, as they are sometimes described. Let's talk about that. Well, I think that, you know, um, I, I just like competition. I, I think competition makes 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 uh, market participants uh, more resilient, stronger. Uh, and therefore, I, I, I think that uh, competition in the currency market is also something positive. Like, like Friedrich August von Hayek already wrote a couple of decades 
ago. So I, I think the fact that all those cryptocurrencies are coming up, I think that's a brilliant development. We all know that uh, 90% or even more of them are rubbish and will not be around in a couple of years. But I, I, I'm also pretty positive that um, some will survive and, 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 and will probably really change the landscape. Um, now, I, I, I think what, what from a kind of philosophical point of view, I love the fact that people are discussing money again, that there's young people hanging around in social media, but also meeting up in person and discuss, uh, is Bitcoin money, is Bitcoin better money than gold uh, or the euro or dollar or whatever, that they start learning about monetary history. I think that's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. that we're seeing at the moment. Um, so, so, so from that perspective i think it's it, it's a great development however um i i think that um you know all gold gold is always uh, or, or many people in the gold industry do see um uh the cryptos as a as a uh, as an enemy of gold from my point of view um they can work together pretty well and there's quite a lot of um fantastic projects coming up uh, at the moment that try to combine the you know the, the oldest uh, money the oldest currency in history physical gold with new technology and and i think you know for 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 um for for the younger generation the millennials I'm not sure if, if, if they will actually um, uh, go to a bank um, like over here in Austria uh, and, 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 and and buy a physical coin of gold uh, perhaps some of them won't even know what a bank actually is or does um, um, they won't go to, to a coin dealership and buy physical gold or silver but I think for, for them it's, 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 it's much more obvious that they would be interested in kind of digital gold that is linked to physical gold uh, stored in a vault in I don't know in Singapore in, in in Dubai or in Switzerland. So so I think you know that's 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 uh, this 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 kind of challenge that we're seeing is something positive. I know that there's plenty of 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 of, of great. Um, um, great minds, uh, entrepreneurs working 24/7 on better solutions. So, so, so that makes me makes me makes me pretty confident going forward. And we should not forget um, that if there is actually um, high physical demand via those platforms. It could also have an impact on on the futures market. We 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 all know at the moment there's like 240 billion US dollar traded in, in paper gold. But if there's out of this uh, crypto revolution coming more physical demand, that might change the market. So um, perhaps I'm, I'm much more, much more positive and much more optimistic about uh, uh, this angle of the gold market. But I just see that there is something developing. Of course, uh, there will be many, many failures, but I think at the end it will be positive for, for the gold market. Well, I love, Roni, how you've put all of that, especially the idea that at least it gets people talking about money and money issues, which is important. And I love that uh, when people that I've talked with younger people or older people, when they finally, you know, start to look at all these coins, many of which will be rubbish, that they can detect where the rubbish is because they want to understand, well, wait a minute, how many can be created? And is there a limit on that? Oh, gosh, you know, that one's not good because they're created willy-nilly and wait who's doing the issuing and what are their motivations which are questions that you're never allowed to ask in public about the federal reserve like who are they and what's their motivation and how many of these things can they make you know bad answers come up to all of those if you dare to, to investigate but the the piece that i really love in there is this idea that it doesn't have to be either or uh, either either you like gold or you like cryptocurrencies it's an and and what i like is this idea that we should have an ecosystem of money systems out there and the ones that are better will perform better and the and money systems do different things and incentivize different things and that's what we really need in this complex world we're in you know this one size fits all fiat currency that's you know made uh, by a small committee of unelected bureaucrats is is obviously an old idea 
uh, one that I sincerely hope this next uh, recession, which could be very, you know, barn burner, really dramatic recession slash um, crisis. I, I really hope that one exposes us all more collectively to the idea that it's a really bad idea to turn over something as important as monetary policy to a small group of PhDs who hold a very, very narrow dogmatic view of how the world works. Uh, and instead, you know, we should have the free market of ideas and um, currencies out there uh, competing as they should. That's what nature teaches us. You know, everything in competition becomes more resilient over time. So I, I like I like that way of looking at it. And um, and so I would really advise anybody who wants to begin to explore those ideas and as well looking at uh, gold in great depth and through a lens of understanding from monetary actions and policy and history. You got to get this uh, report. It's in gold we trust and it's just fantastic. Um, Roni, uh, where can people find it? How can they download it? Uh, well, it's actually uh, available for, for free on our webpage, uh, ingoldwetrust.report uh, or ingoldwetrust.li. Um, there's a compact version, um, which is like, you know, if, if you don't want to spend so much time on studying uh, 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 gold and everything around, but there's also the extended version. It's also for free uh, and it can all be found on our webpage. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. And and so the summary of all of this after 230 pages, where do you think we are? Uh, gold is, are we at the beginning of a of a bull market here or something else? Yeah, uh, that's that's what we wrote last year, actually, that we're at the beginning uh, of uh, of a new stage of a bull market. Um, we have seen a massive massive correction uh, with a with a with a with a, a big drawdown, but we are seeing that commitment of traders report uh, is is suggesting that there that there has been a, a washout. We're seeing that sentiment is is really negative. Um, we're seeing that nobody really cares about gold and especially mining stocks. Uh, and especially about silver. Silver is probably uh, mm -hmm. the biggest contrarian uh, investment or silver mining stocks are probably even more contrarian at the moment. So so, so that makes me confident uh, on, on the sector. But we all know that um, the herd behavior uh, in the sector is is getting more extreme. I think it's also, you know, uh, has got to do with uh, career risk in the financial market mm. industry. Um, so nobody really wants to to make a contrarian call. But I know that once we once we go above this 1360, 3080 um, resistance, which is also the neckline of a large inverse uh, shoulder head shoulder formation, um, I, I think gold will 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 hit 15, 1600 um, pretty quickly. The most important thing is um, in comparison to all the monetary printing that we've seen in the last couple of years, actually gold got significantly cheaper. Gold in monetary terms is dirt cheap at the moment. We're basically at the same levels like in 1971 when it comes to the gold backing of the US dollar. So I think it's uh, it, it might sound a bit strange, but gold is a bargain uh, at, at this level. And of course, we need some sort of catalysts. I think one of the main catalysts will probably be recession fears coming up um, and, and more volatility in equity markets. That's going to go hand in hand. And we'll see it sooner or later. And I agree as well with an earlier point you made that that um, uh, oil is is really a it's an asset I, I think is is badly undervalued at this point simply because it's below its marginal cost of production for all the new fields that need to be out there. So commodities below their marginal cost of production, which by the way includes silver. Um, you know where where it's uh, yep. direct silver mines are none of them are reporting. Uh, you know, being able to pull it out of the ground for an all-in cost of 1640 or wherever it is at this exact moment. So uh, I love commodities below their cost of production. And, uh, and so for that reason, I like silver. And oil and gold are very highly correlated. And of course, you look out just two, three years for oil, you see a big structural shortfall that exists. Um, you know, unless there's a giant rip-roaring recession that kills demand, there's going to be a supply shortfall then, and if not then, just a little later than then. Um, so so I, I, I love all of these things. And uh, of course, I like being a contrarian, I guess. So um, with that, hey, Roni, thank you so much for your time today in this fascinating podcast. And uh, tell, uh, how can people follow you and your work more closely? 
Well, I'm I'm on Twitter, uh, Ron Stoefele, um, um, S T O E F E R L E. That's my last name. Um, I'm on Twitter. Um, uh, of course, you can find all information about uh, our company, what we're doing, where we're coming from, where we're going to, uh, on incrementum.li. Li, which stands for Liechtenstein, where we're based, and there's also you can subscribe to our research for the for the several uh, 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 analysis and research reports that we're producing. And uh, yeah, just 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 Google me, and you will find plenty of information probably. Fantastic. Well, we'll put links to all of that below this podcast. Thanks again for your time, and really mostly thank you so much for putting out such a huge amount of work, making it free and uh, really doing it in the spirit of educating people so that they can know what's happening and maybe protect their wealth. The very, very noble causes. So thank you for all of that and especially for spending some time with us today. Thank you very much, Chris. I also I read your book uh, a couple of years ago and it was definitely an eye-opening eye-opener for me. So I have to thank you as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're most welcome. <laughs>